Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic View Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and you can also visit our website, which is www.theorganicview.com. If you have any questions or would like to connect with us, you can simply post a question on our wall on Facebook, send us a tweet to at The Organic View, or contact me directly at June Stoyer on Twitter. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at theorganicview.com. Today's show is sponsored by Eden Foods, one of the most trusted names in certified organic clean foods. Listeners of the Organic View Radio Show can receive 20% off any regularly priced items, excluding cases. Simply enter the coupon code ORGVIEW when prompted during checkout. That's ORGVIEW. For more special offers, please visit our website at www.theorganicview.com. On today's show, biologist Dr. Thomas D. Seeley from Cornell University will be my guest today to talk about his fascinating work with honeybees and how they communicate. So I'd like to welcome to the show Dr. Thomas Seeley. Good afternoon, sir, and welcome to the show. Oh, good afternoon, June. My pleasure to be with you. Before we begin, can you share with our listeners a little bit about yourself? Yes, yeah. I'm a, see, I'm a 62-year-old guy who's been studying the behavior and social life of honeybees since he was oh, since he was a teenager, about 15 or 16 years old. Uh, I had the pleasure of discovering this fascinating part of nature early on in life. It actually goes back to when I was a third grader and was introduced to bees by uh, one of the student's parents who was a beekeeper. And I discovered this interest and thought I would go to medical school, but ended up pursuing my passion of trying to understand how a honeybee colony works and uh, have stayed with that as my target of my research. And uh, But I also teach more broadly on the whole subject of animal behavior. Thank you. Can you explain to our audience how sophisticated is the individual honeybee? Yes, I, I'd be happy to do that. That's such a rich question. How sophisticated are honeybees? Well, honeybees are remarkably complicated creatures. One might think because they're small and just an insect that they they don't do things very in a very complicated way. But when you actually look at the life of a bee and what it how it behaves, you realize that this is a, a creature that's very flexible in its behavior. For example, just to go through the life of a worker bee, it starts out, it's born inside a hive, it comes out, and what does it do? It has to start cleaning cells, the cells from which they're, the, the cells in the wax comb that they popped out of and developed in. Then it switches over to, to making food for the other young bees, and it has to carefully dole out the food, has to eat the right ingredients in the hive, make the right food, get the, give the right amount to the bee. It will also have to spend time shaping up the combs, molding them, getting them where they've been nicked or bent, something like that. They have to take those and get get all the wax combs back in shape. Then they do things like receiving water from bees coming from outside the hive and and sharing that within the hive. They also do things like stopping and standing in one place for a while and producing wax, the beeswax from which they build the combs. When there's an intruder in the nest, if a wasp or something like that tries to get in the nest, the bee has to function as a guard. And then at the end of its life, it takes on the very complicated task of venturing out into the wide world, flying out for miles and miles around the hive, and being able to go out, collect, visit flowers, collect nectar and pollen, and then find her way all the way back to the hive, which might be just a tree in the middle of the forest. So I think you can see that a worker bee is behaviorally extremely versatile and is very skilled, especially at finding its way to and from its hive. It's really a marvelous creature. Can you talk about communication? How do honeybees communicate? Communication in bees is a super rich topic. And this is because honeybees live in elaborate societies. And in order for any animal society to function well, the individuals within that society have to be able to share information, share information about what needs to be done, share information about conditions outside the, outside the group, things like that. And bees, bees have two main modes of communication because most of their communication occurs inside, in the dark, inside a beehive. And when you think about it, how are bees 
living in the dark going to communicate? Two main modalities. One is chemical communication, and the other one is by vibrations, uh, sounds, uh, or sounds either past, uh, particularly for bees, past B to B or through the combs. And so, for example, if they need to sound the danger of alarm, if there's a wasp at the nest entrance, for example, the bees near the nest entrance will release uh, a chemical from the tip of their um, abdomen, which is an alarm pheromone, and that will bring other guard bees straight to the entrance to help join in the defense. If the bee is trying to indicate that where the location of a rich food source outside the hive, she'll produce a mechanical signal called the waggle dance. And when I say mechanical, I mean she's moving her body, making vibrations um, that provide that information. So thinking about bees and how they communicate, you're thinking about creatures working in the dark, communicating through scent and sounds. These are not little robots. They're not blindly programmed to, to do just a few simple things. They have to learn. They have to do a great deal of learning during their lives. And I think that's often not recognized um, in insects. And for example, when a bee leaves her hive, she has to memorize what her hive looks like. And she has to learn the landmarks around her hive so that she can find her way back. And when she gets out, when she's gone out into the fields she, and she's looking for flowers, when she finds good ones, she has to memorize where those flowers are, what they look like, and how they smell so that she can find those flowers again. So a tremendous amount of learning goes on in these, in these little insects. And they're, they really are master learners. It's interesting when you look at something, when you look at an animal like a bear or a raccoon, they just need to learn something once and that's it. And when you look at human beings, we just keep making the same mistakes over and over and over. And then you think about the honeybee, which is not just doing the things that she does just for herself, but for the whole colony. So it's really quite fascinating. That's right. When you think about a, a bee, you have to you have to understand that it's she's functioning in the colony much like a cell functions in your own body. She's just one part of a larger whole. She doesn't she doesn't reproduce herself. She, she, she achieves her success in life, and this is genetic success, um, by helping her mother, the queen bee, produce more queens and, 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 uh, and, and more colonies of bees. So, yeah, a bee is, a, is, uh, is part of a, very, of a very complicated larger whole that is the, honeybee, the whole honeybee society. Can you explain what swarming is and how honeybees know when to swarm? Yes. Thank you for asking about swarming because it's something that there's a lot of misunderstanding about and a lot of fear about. And so I'd like to talk about that in some detail. Um, swarming is a process whereby a honeybee colony divides itself. It, it reproduces itself. And it does this by a process in which about two-thirds of the worker bees in a colony and that would be about 15,000 bees, leaves with the old queen, and they, they set out from their nest. It could be either a beekeeper's hive or a nest in a tree in the woods. They fly out en masse. It only, they leave in about 10 minutes altogether, and they fly off, and they then cluster on a tree branch or on a mailbox or on a light post, whatever. And then they conduct a search for a new home. And one thing I want to stress here is that when if somebody finds one of these swarm clusters, and it looks a lot like it's about the size of a soccer ball, it's brown, um, it looks terrifying because it's some 10 or 15,000 stinging insects forming this cluster hanging on, like I say, on a tree branch or somebody's mailbox or whatever. It looks ter terrifying. And I remember the first time I saw one as a boy, I didn't want to go near it at all. But I've learned um, that these honeybees, when they're in a swarm, even though they can sting, they don't sting. And the reason they don't sting is because they only sting other animals in defense of their nest. And when they're in a swarm, they don't have a nest. They don't have anything to defend. And in fact, they're loath to sting anything because that would mean they would have that many fewer bees to uh, be in the swarm. So if somebody sees a swarm, June, I think it's it's really important and valuable for them to realize that, A, these, 
bees are not offensive, they're not dangerous, and and um, uh, and B that these bees are not taking up residence in that where they're clustering. They're just in a temporary bivouac in the process of looking for a new home, and they're going to move on. So no need to call the exterminator. No need to get in a panic. In a day or two, the bees will be gone. What is the criteria that the bees use to figure out where they're going to be moving to? The bees, when they're in that cluster, they're they're conducting this a, a careful search for a new home site. And what they're looking for is a site which is usually a hollow in a tree or a cavity in a building that has a couple of features that are critical to their survival. One is that the cavity has um, a, a, enough room in it to support the, the life of a honeybee colony. This would be typically about the size of, has to be the size of a good sized wastebasket and about 10 gallons of, of volume. They need that space for just to build their home. The other thing they need is that the entrance is small so that it's not a, it's only about a, an inch or two of square area, one or two square area, inches of area. And that's important because they want to be able to defend their nest well, and they want the nest to be not drafty in the winter. And that's really, that last part is really important. Honeybee colonies survive winter by producing heat in their nests with their, with their muscles. They produce muscular heat with their flight muscles, and they form a ball of bees. And all winter long, they keep the inside of that cluster at about 90 degrees Fahrenheit. They produce that heat by burning the honey that they've stored in their nest you know, through metabolic activity. So they need a cavity that's large enough to store up enough honey for them to get through the winter. They need a cavity that's well protected so it's not cold air, there's no cold air blowing through the cavity all winter long. And ideally, they'll find a site where the entrance is high off the ground. And the reason for that is that in nature, there are predators like bears that will tend to overlook uh, a honeybee nest if it's high in the air, but will tend to notice it if it's close to the ground. And one thing I want to stress, too, is that we're talking about a nest of honeybees, and this, these are honeybees nest inside cavities, and they build their beeswax comb in these cavities. We're not talking about a nest of, of wasps. Many people think that when they see a, a gray paper nest of wasps, that that's a honeybee nest. That's actually just a, a wasp nest. Thank you. If there's something that you'd like to share with our listeners as they venture out during the warm weather and they happen to notice the honeybees or other bees, what would you like to have our listeners remember? One thing I, I hope your listeners will, um, I'd like to share with your listeners is uh, is this idea that a swarm of bees is not a dangerous is not a dangerous thing, and in fact that it's something to be really admired and allowed to to live and exist. No need, to, as I say, no need to call the exterminator. And I say that for a couple of reasons. One is, is that the bees are very important to the whole ecosystem. They pollinate the plants. Without any plants, if the flowers are not pollinated, they don't produce any. Uh, fruits or seeds. Bees as pollinators are extremely important. The other reason that it's important to not harm a, a swarm of bees is that, that that's the future of a colony, uh, sitting there in your backyard or whatever. The future of that species depends upon these swarms being able to establish new colonies. And then thirdly, I'd, I'd like to just stress the fact that these are actually really wonderful creatures. I mean, they are a remarkable product of evolution by natural selection that uh, most species of insects are solitary insects. It's one female, she mates, she's fertilized, and then she goes out and um, captures prey and produces her own little family. But here we have, a in the honeybee colony, we have something much, much more complicated than that. It's a whole society of 10 or 20 or 30,000 individuals working together in harmony. It's like the difference between... Uh, you know, a small town in a vast city in the insect world. So this is a, a remarkable creation and, and one that we can treasure and respect. Dr. Silly, it has been a pleasure talking to you today. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your very busy schedule to discuss your knowledge about honeybees with our listeners. My pleasure to you, Jim. Thank you very much for having me on. You're very welcome. And folks, 
please pick up a copy of Dr. Seeley's book, Honeybee Democracy, if you'd like to learn more. And folks, if you do have a swarm that needs to be removed, please contact your local county extension for information about a local beekeeper who can remove it or contact your local beekeeping club. Thank you for tuning in. This has been June Stoyer with the Organic Bee Radio Show. Have a great afternoon, everyone.